Seeing the material I sent you, uh, it did strike me there was quite a lot of it this week. Is that the case? I must, I must ask you again about the uh, number of pages you feel you can cope with in any given week. Okay. Here we are. Are we ready? Um, years and years and years ago, um, on the uh, radio in England, they used to have this thing called um, Children's Hour. It was actually before my time even, so I just remember this secondhand from my parents telling me. And every episode of this program, which was essentially storytelling for children, the presenter would start by asking, Are you sitting comfortably? Then I shall begin. So, the question goes out to you all. I hope you're all comfortable, ready to start tapping, scribbling. Energy tourism, the un and underemployed. Obviously, um, I'm not going to try and cover everything that one could cover. It would be very easy to have a course-long lecture on economics of North Africa. Um, I think what I'm about to give you, though, will be a nice overview to supplement your readings, as well as to reinforce some of the lessons I hope you've taken away. Um, I didn't really see a need for an introduction. I'm just going to go straight into this. The first section will be the historical overview from independence right up to the eve of the Arab uprisings. So via um, these free markets, as we, we do, in, um, as Michael Shirk was doing, sounds air quotes. Were the markets really free in North Africa? Well, short answer, no. So that's why I've had to put them in inverted commas. Economic liberalization, did it take place um, up to a point, I suppose? Uh, the second section, we'll look at energy, tourism, and remittances, the three main sources of revenue for the uh, countries of North Africa. And then the un- and underemployed. This is, the, section three is going to be the most, um, not the most difficult to deliver, but certainly the least satisfying in terms of the data. Because when you are looking at informal sectors of an economy, people don't register to tell you that they're not registered for taxation or that they are working under the radar. So the, the, the informal sector, as it's known, is a very, very complex thing. And it doesn't just involve, I'll mention this now in case I don't remember later. When we talk about the informal sector, people often point to the um, man who's got a little kiosk on the street corner selling cigarettes, biscuits and tins of Coca-Cola. But the informal sector in North Africa, you must remember, and you must get it into your heads, because we're going to deal with some startlingly large figures. The informal sector can also involve major industry. So there are manufacturing plants, concrete plants, um, assembly plants, with huge factories employing thousands of people that equally are part of the informal sector, by which I mean they pay no taxation, and they might be paying bribes and backhanders to members of a government, but they're certainly part of the informal sector because the country does not benefit from collecting any tax on that work. So very important and often overlooked, I think, by, um, if not by economists, then commentators, this idea that the informal sector uh, its generally about the little people, but it's not by any means them who are making most of the money. And then a couple of closing thoughts. So, from state control to free markets. It might seem crazy when I keep banging on about the differences between the countries of North Africa to try and lump them all together now in this overview of economics from independence to the Arab uprisings. But we can, to a degree, do this because the situation upon independence was not dissimilar in the countries of North Africa, there were lots of commonalities. It is also true that the countries, as we have seen, all became independent more or less at the same time. So while we look at the situation in Egypt in 1956 or Algeria in 1962, we think about those national borders, we think about their position in North Africa, we must also always remember to look at global affairs. Um, there's two the comment about it's about the economy, stupid, is one that's always worth remembering. And the other comment that we've heard used as a nice catchphrase is, all politics is local. Equally, there are trends taking place around the world that impact on that local situation. And this is very important when we look later at things like the influence of the World Bank and the IMF. That is central to what happened across 
um, North Africa, and it impacted on every country in North Africa just at different times and to different degrees. So, Exodus of Foreign Skills and Finance. This was most stark, of course, in Algeria, where on independence, one-tenth of the population left. One in ten people left. Now, those are the Pieds Noirs, the French settlers, some of whom had been there for more than a century. So how French were they? Well, they were probably had paler skin than the indigenous peoples, but so what? That's, that's really the only marker that they would have. They would perhaps claim an allegiance to Paris before they would to Algiers, but they were Algerians to, for all intents and purposes. And when they left, they took as much money as they could. Obviously, they couldn't take their land with them physically, and it was that land which the government in Algeria um, uh, took back for the, the state. But they also took their talent. They took their talent as administrators and they took their talent as managers. And that was something which happened across North Africa, but in Algeria to a much greater extent than elsewhere. Um, not by chance, the occupying colonial powers in North Africa did not train up the local people to manage their own economies during their periods of occupation, however long or brief those periods of occupation may have been. In Algeria, the French were there for over 130 years, and yet, if you look at those uh, native Algerians who had a university degree, you could count them almost on the fingers of your hands. This was a deliberate policy which gave the French colonial powers powers over the native people who were kept impoverished, ignorant, and unable to run the country. This was a great problem upon independence. Very easy to wave that flag, have a revolution, get rid of uh, an occupying power. What next? We've, we've seen it in Egypt in the past two years, and in Libya and elsewhere. Once the cry of nationalism has died down, and the next question is, how do we run a country? Well, you're going to need some skilled people to help you. North Africa suffered from either the lack of that or the exodus. Limited industrial infrastructure. Um, again, I'm going back to Algeria because it's the example which jumps out most readily. Um, you remember the black banner of the OAS, that uh, French-inspired terrorist group? They had a campaign the last two years of French control in Algeria, 1961-1962. They had a campaign of destroying um, all factory equipment and all industry that they possibly could. So much of that was French-owned, but when the French realized that they, or the Pied Noir, I should say, when they realized they couldn't take it home, they smashed it. It was like a scorched earth policy, such as you know, one would see in the retreat from Moscow. Uh, they, they went out of their way to destroy everything possible. So when independence is gained, it's uh, something of a meaningless or empty victory in many senses. There's nothing left to make the country work, except the human capital and one might argue, the will of the people. But we really have to talk about the wills of the peoples. And that lack of unity upon independence is also a major problem. You need a strong government to have a sensible economic policy. You know, we might argue that the policy of party X or Y is the wrong policy, and thus in a democratic system you can vote them out. And the next party come in and we complain about them in their turn. But at least we have this changeover and a government which... Um, in some places more than others, can do its best to uh, keep the economy running. I, 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 I dread reading the Washington Post these days to see what's happening uh, at home here. But um, I don't know if all those government workers are thrilled to have all these unpaid holidays now. But there we are. Political elites, one colonial legacy. Yes, indeed. Um, something else which um, has its reflection in what we were listening to earlier for those downstairs on the Mali uh, lecture... The powers that were in place when the foreign um, occupiers left, whether they be the British or, or the French or indeed the Spanish in northern Morocco, had often greatly upset the natural power bases that had been in place previously. In Libya, there was no real nation state to speak of. So we have this king imposed, in a sense. I mean, he was head of one of the three Ottoman provinces. So there wasn't even a sense of statehood in much of North Africa when the occupiers left, primarily because there had been no experience of ruling. So without any ruling elite before, how are you going to have one upon independence? 
again, a major problem for coming up with a serious, coherent economic policy. This results across the region in a very heavy-handed state-controlled system. They weren't all by any means socialist systems. Um, Morocco, perhaps, was the least socialist inclined of the five states across North Africa. But they certainly did have in common that whoever was in power or took power upon independence made very, very sure to hold all the power themselves. Um, I know that uh, it's the Willis, isn't it? The Willis keeps talking about political power and economic power and the crossover. I think he's right to a large extent that very often in the late 50s and through the 60s up to the 70s and beyond, I suppose, arguably, the powers that be in those countries of North Africa used economic policy as a political tool, not because they were great or clever economists. And I think that's a serious problem for the countries of the region. So throughout the 1970s, we had this expansion of socialist planning. As I said, it was different to different, extent, to different degrees in different countries. Um, the difference of opinion, to put it mildly, between Algeria and Morocco stems from this time. Um, in much the same way that Al-Qaeda today accuses uh, all monarchies of the region as being illegitimate, as being un-Islamic, and other states for that matter, the non-monarchies too. Algeria and Morocco questioned each other's legitimacy. Um, that's just tying into the, the socialist planning stages. Uh, as the sole monarchy in um, North Africa, Morocco's ability to impact economic policy was perhaps stronger than in other countries because they did have this uh, ruling family behind which the population, more or less, were forced to um, exceed. Oh, I've mentioned this already. The economic policy is a political tool, something which Willis is keen to um, talk about, and I'm sure that we will deal with that in the seminar. And I, I didn't um, email you out, but thank you. Um, who sent me the email this morning about the seminar questions? Thank you. Good questions. I look forward to the seminar with bated breath. Um, economies. In an ideal world, a national economy would be what we call balanced. And I don't mean in terms of budgets, although that would be nice too. But in terms more of having a diverse basket of goods, services, um, manufacturing, that means when there are lean times for the price of oil, your country doesn't end up on the verge of collapse. Well, unfortunately, for most of the countries in North Africa, their economies were not terribly diverse. So it's primarily gas and petroleum products in Algeria, primarily oil and petroleum products in Libya, uh, phosphates for Morocco, um, Suez Canal revenues and tourism in Egypt, and for Tunisia, um, again, tourism, and for all of them, remittances. So the rise and fall in oil, gas, and phosphate prices has a massive impact on your country, as you can well imagine. The periodic increased revenues, which are concomitant with these um, narrow economies, may seem like a very good thing when the price of oil shoots up. But it does mean that all the profits go to that one sector, and that sector tends not to share the profits evenly with the country. Um, in Algeria, Sonatrac is the state-owned um, energy company. Well, do you think for a minute that Sonatrac sees the money it raises distributed evenly across Algerian society so that a more egalitarian state is arrived at? I'll let you be the judge. This was the result. Um, I don't know if we used this slide already. This is um, a Volkswagen Beetle having been destroyed in the streets of Cairo in 1977. Bread riots. Subsidies played a very important part in each of those countries in North Africa and continue to do so today where the government had a bit of spare cash to spend on subsidising fuel, flour and other staple goods. You try and take that away from the people and the difference between a few piastres here or there will be starvation or not. So this picture is from 1977. A similar picture with a different car 
you would see in 1987, 1988 in Algeria. You saw it across North Africa in 2010 with the Arab uprisings. Um, we're going to talk more about the Arab uprisings, of course, in due course. Of course, in due course. But um, the fact is that economics was central to those uprisings. Democracy, fine, all well and good. But if people feel that they have um, a purpose or a use, not necessarily for their society, but certainly in terms of being able to feed their families and have an education, which will lead to getting a job, which leads to them feeding their families, they are far less likely to go out and torch VW Beetles that don't belong to them. So to the 1980s, as I said, this is a very quick survey. We have, we have the more the meaty bits coming, so just hang on. 80s, all right, you with me? Good. Aren't you glad I'm not running a soundtrack with this? We'd have Duran Duran playing there. So, a decline in the price of oil and gas and phosphates was common across the region. Um, in 1985, 86, you remember Duran Duran? Only the two of us, I suppose. No. The rest of the class, I'm sure doesn't. Of course you did. Yeah, you know, Sean knows. All right, we'll have Duran Duran after the break. I'll find some on uh, YouTube. And you'll all go, ooh. Um, look at that hair. Um, 1985, 86, the price of oil dropped by 40%, which meant that, for example, in Algeria where the government relies on this revenue, they've lost 40% of their budget virtually overnight. That's not a small chunk of change to a government which doesn't have any other sectors to fall back on. The governments of North Africa, to their credit, I suppose one could say, um, and in stark contrast to the colonial powers, did spend a lot of money in the early years after independence educating their populations. Oh dear, what a pity. Now you have an educated population that realise they could be doing so much better and a government that isn't providing employment, a government that isn't providing even an economic system whereby the free market can rise up perhaps and they'll find uh, non-government employment. So no, you've got an increasingly educated um, population with increasing unemployment. Um, this whole point here I could you know, put in inverted commas. Economic liberalisation introduced, yes, up to a point. Um, sometimes that point was the point of a pen, which signed an agreement for economic liberalisation, and that was as far as it ever went. I suppose the worst offenders for this uh, would be Algeria, had the least... Um, Algeria and Libya, yeah, let's single those two out. Algeria and Libya had the... Uh, moved least down the path of, towards economic liberalisation. Of course, they had the biggest wealth when the price of oil and gas was doing well. Um, in other places, as um, I think Willis talks about again, what looked like economic liberalisation was actually the government allowing business to start up on its own, but then taking legitimately or otherwise in name or not in name the majority share of these companies. Um, I know we've mentioned Egypt before, and the Egyptian military, I mean, it's so opaque, it's, it's almost worthless mentioning figures, but economists who have done their best to disentangle the Egyptian military from the um, state economy reckon that the Egyptian military is responsible for 40%, 40% of Egyptian GDP. Um, probably not a good idea, would be my take on it. Um, and that's what they mean by economic liberalisation. It's not fair, is it? No, not quite. The rising unemployment we've mentioned, <coughs> and rising population. We've discussed this point before, but it's worth coming back to. 1980, suddenly you've got all these young people who didn't have any role in the uh, wars of independence. They have no memory of not being independent. What do they care about the leadership of these ruling parties who have now been in without any legitimate political opposition since 1956 or since 1952 or 62? Suddenly, you've got these young people who don't give two hoots for the people that said, we did it for you, we, we fought and we've liberated the country. So what? It was 20 years ago. It's our turn now. And what are you providing? Next to nothing. Uh, an expensive, expensive education, or for actually a free education, which is expensive for the country and no provision of employment. Now, I hope you all recognize this flag. 
after I made such a big fuss about it two weeks ago. Yes? All together now. The Arab Maghreb Union. Excellent. Well, wasn't this a boom to the region? Because here, for the first time, we have an economic union with five local states, all working together in perfect harmony, like hand in glove, with tied economies which were good for all across the region. Oh, if only that were the reality. No. In 1989, the AMU was founded, um, since which time it has done nothing, apart from meet on occasion and um, stop talking to each other uh, for the rest of the time. It's a pity. In any consideration of the economies of North Africa from, let's say, 89 and the founding of the AMU to the present day, it remains a great idea. I think a degree of economic integration is accepted even by the nation-states themselves as being the way ahead. If they didn't think it was a good idea, they wouldn't have signed up to it in the first place. Sadly, when we think again about um, economics as a political tool, it's political problems that are preventing the forward motion of the AMU. So on to the 90s. Who would be our, who would be our soundtrack for the 90s? Anyone? I can't think of any 90s bands. Do we have, oh, Nirvana, I suppose. That would work for me. Nirvana. Nothing else good came out of the 90s, I don't think. Hmm? Spice Girls. Spice Girls. Like I said, nothing else good came out of the 90s. Um, so. Dear Matthew's band. Okay, I'll tell you what I want. Uh, <laughs> increasing expressions of public anger. Of course, time is going on. There is no forward progress. It's even worse now in the 90s because all these governments have been saying, look, economic liberalisation. Yeah, there are a few more people driving BMWs and Mercedes, but a very few. And guess what? They're all either related to or very friendly with the ruling elites. There is no sense of private business being allowed to develop on its own without uh, wasta, without influence, without knowing somebody at the top. There is a general retreat from the socialist policies. This ties in, I suppose, with the alleged liberalisation of the economies. But now the governments have a problem because they're saying, well, we've been following these socialist principles, these revolutionary principles since independence because it was the right thing to do for the country and for the good of the country. And now they're saying, uh, but they've all failed. They've got no political opponents to blame it on. And that is one of the reasons that anger um, grows among the nations. Uh, because the people say, well, you started it, now you're finishing it, and it's still broken. Who else are we going to blame apart from you? Creates political vacuum. It doesn't create a political vacuum at the top. I mean, the National Democratic Party in Egypt, for example, did not lose its power because it had lost control of the economy. It just became more repressive. And if you think back to Tunisia, it was the same for the last decade of uh, Bourguiba's rule. He became more repressive. Things didn't improve under Ben Ali. Police states, military states became um, tighter and tighter on any form of political opposition. But there was certainly an increase in political opposition. Economics remain political tool. I think I've covered that in the previous points. To the 2000s. Now we're really struggling for the musical theme. Um, yikes. 2000s. I'm afraid I don't know any music from the 2000s. Or do I? Educate me, somebody. Justin Timberlake. I've heard the name. <laughs> doesn't he make shoes as well? I, I know he doesn't. I'm joking. Uh, uh, increased influence of international agencies. This, this is where things get interesting. For the independent, remember, independent states of North Africa. Already by the 1980s, every state in North Africa except Algeria had signed on to one or more agreements with the IMF and or World Bank. Algeria succumbed in 1994 to signing up to an agreement which they had resisted for a long time. Why did the countries of North Africa resist? 
because when you sign up to an agreement with an international authority, you are de facto losing some domestic power. You've agreed to pay back money. So you can renege on your, renege on your repayments for sure. But then you stop getting the money that you so desperately need or the expertise, whether it's loans, whether it's aid, whether it's knowledge. The countries of the region sign up for these loans or these other agreements. It wasn't always loans, of course. They sign up because they have to. Um, Algeria, I just mentioned 1994. We know what was happening in Algeria in 1994. They're in the middle of a very nasty war. You can see how desperate the ruling party must have been to choose that moment to invite the IMF to take a degree of control away from them, which is what happens with any international financing agreement. The, growth, the continuing growth of the free market saw a few more uh, crony businesses starting up, but it was crony capitalism on a large scale. This is the time when um, we mentioned earlier the informal sector really taking off in a big way. During the 2000s that you had major enterprises, I, I mean, if you looked at a Forbes list, uh, Fortune 500 list for companies in Africa, I wouldn't be surprised if 10% of them in the North African line were illegitimate businesses. That is, outside of formal control. They exist in this sort of grey area with backhanders being all you need and a good contact in government to set up a major business. Um, and it's done in many ways. In Egypt, I was just thinking, there was um, a new law came in. I think it was 1999 or 2000. Uh, I was in Cairo at the time, and suddenly I noticed uh, small fire extinguishers appearing in cars. And I said to the driver... What's this with all the fire extinguishers? And he said, our oh, new law, we have to carry fire extinguishers. And I said, well, that's probably a good thing, because these cars are old and ratty, and they do blow up, so it's not you know, such a bad thing. He said, yeah, but the president's son owns the fire extinguisher manufacturing company. And you think, huh, so that's how you get a law passed. There was another uh, spate of about ten years in Egypt when you couldn't fly from uh, Luxor or Aswan south to Abu Simbel. I mean, beg your pardon, as you were, you had to fly from Luxor or Aswan south to Abu Simbel. National airlines, yeah, not so national as you think. Again, the controlling interests were Mubarak um, clansmen and friends. Uh, they, they flagged terrorism as the risk, post-1997 and the attack at um, Hatshepsut Temple. But really, again, another example of how somebody can do very well, thank you very much, using economics as a political tool. Um, partial decline in elites. Again, partial, I should have put in inverted commas. They may have lost a degree of control, but they were also gaining a great deal of money out of this. You know, they benefited. If it's not to the president's or the president's family's or friend's benefit to set up a company, that company doesn't get set up. Bottom line. Again, this is attendant to the 80s, 90s. Doubling of populations in 30 years across North Africa. A doubling. Every country in North Africa doubled its population in the first 30 years after independence. Where are the jobs coming from? It's a question we can ask ourselves again today in the wake of the Arab uprising. Where are the jobs coming from? I don't have a simple answer, I'm afraid. Every year in Egypt, uh, oh, the figures just escaped me, is it 40,000 people uh, are leaving school? There must be a great deal more than that. Um, the jobs aren't being created. The jobs just are not appearing. Um, and North Africa is suffering terribly at the moment because the things that they were relying on, such as tourism, um, are simply not happening anymore. The only thing that Egypt is doing well in is um, Suez Canal revenues, which are up last year um, on the year before. But revenues from one source of, of business is not enough. So, I've probably uh, got ahead of myself a bit here, but part two, energy, tourism and remittances. Energy. That's not all there is to say about energy, by the way. That's just to make sure everybody's following me. There's a lot more to say about energy. I think I've used this slide before. It's a very complex mass of green and red pipelines which show oil and gas in North Africa. Uh, you know, the executive summary, oil and gas is very important in North Africa. It's, it's central, of course, to the economies of Algeria and Libya, um, very important in Egypt, important more domestically in Tunisia.
But every one of these countries has started trying to become export nations. Tunisia can't keep up because they don't have enough supplies. Egypt is still exporting oil and gas, um, LNG in particular, um, LPG, liquid petroleum gas, which is doing very well. Um, and of course, the uh, Algerians exporting as much as possible up to Europe. You won't see much Algerian petrol in America um, because there's no need. You've got better sources locally. This is why the Algerian um, oil and gas sector is doing so well in Europe. They're a very short journey. And it's very pure, uh, as is Libyan oil, very pure form of petroleum. It needs very, very little refining. That is not the case, for instance, with um, fracking and shale gas, which needs a lot more work than does the oil and gas from Libya and Algeria. So this is the reality on the ground. This is um, a plant in Algeria. There was an attack, as you all know, on the in Aminas oil uh, gas installation in Algeria not too long ago. Why? Because if you can stop the oil and gas production in a country like Algeria, you can, the uh, terrorist groups believe, topple the government. <coughs> it's interesting that in Libya, oil and gas plants weren't really targeted during the civil war because... They weren't terrorist groups at work so much as a national organization or national rebellion, <coughs> bless you, which understood the importance of having a working oil and gas sector after the fall of Gaddafi. Big difference between having local uprising and local terrorist groups who don't really care what they do to the national economy. It's been argued that the Algerians are doing a very good job of protecting oil and gas installations because not many have been attacked. I think another point is that they're so very far away from population centers, it's very hard to get to them. That's a, maybe a more important reason than the efficiency of the Algerian armed forces. Um, don't try and look at all of these numbers. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an infographic, you know. It gives you a snapshot of Egyptian imports in 2010. The important thing to note is that there are lots of different colors. All right, I hope I'm not getting too complicated for you. The darker colours, the, the black-brown colours here, are the petroleum sector. This is heavy industry, ferrous metals. The words are cut off. Look, when I, send this, when I put the slides online, please feel free to study them. They're all the product of um, a team at Harvard University who produced these fascinating infographics for every country in the world. You can waste hours playing around with them and putting different years in and seeing them the, the change. I've got a few more of these, so I'm going to skip over it very quickly. The thing is, as I say, the variety of colours. That's what you want to know. Egyptian imports. Tunisia imports. Okay, so they've moved the petroleum from top right to bottom left corner. But you see, it's still fairly mixed. Pretty well on imports. A mixed bag. Morocco. More of the same. Like I say, when you go online, I'll send you the link to these, you can hover your mouse and it will tell you exactly what each of these boxes <coughs> constitutes. And some of them are very, very small indeed. So, <coughs> Libya imports. <coughs> cruise ships. Oh, cruise ships. And, and Algeria. Okay, let's move from imports to exports. Egypt. Okay, you can see that although we never really think of Egypt as a major oil and gas producer, the petroleum sector remains quite important, um, along with heavy industry and, and related industries there. Tunisia, less so. Um, Europe particularly, we, we take a lot of Tunisian-made uh, cloth and clothes. Semi-skilled labour to put this stuff together in factories often employed um, often employs women. Very important for the Tunisian economy. And Morocco the same. Lots of textile manufacturing. Um, phosphates much bigger here. And what else for us? Pentoxide, which of course we all know what that's for. Good. Um, <laughs> wow. And look at that one. I'm going to stand aside for a second just so you can see it in its true glory. Algerian exports, 2010. Wowzers. 41% petroleum oils and crude. 40% petroleum gases. Algeria, um, described as an import-import nation. 
<laughs> you can see why. And that's Libya. They haven't even got that split between oil and gas. I mean, I feel like the room's gone dark in here. It's like a shadow has come over us with this 79% block, petroleum oil crude. Somebody said of Libya, it doesn't have a national economy. It has a savings account, and they're drawing on it very heavily. So they will just keep spending and spending and spending oil revenue for as long as they've got it. And who can blame them? But that is not the same as having an economy or a vision for what you want to do with your country. They are just spending their way out of trouble, arguably in the short term. But this doesn't employ nearly enough people. Everybody was terribly excited after the fall of Gaddafi that the oil and gas in Libya got back to its pre-war levels very, very quickly. And sure, that was very important, particularly whilst the international community was withholding Libyan assets overseas while we decided if we accepted this new government or not. The reason that the oil and gas industry got on its feet so quickly in Libya after the fall of Gaddafi was because it's all run by foreign workers. There is not a highly skilled work, um, set of workers in Libya. Most of the engineers are Europeans and Americans. The Libyans, for sure, provide um, the brute force, the labor that needs, um, needs to operate in an oil and gas field too. But not nearly enough of this sector employs locals. And it takes time to train people. It's not going to happen overnight. Another form of energy which may yet take off. I think I may have mentioned a company called Desert Tech to you before and their plan for solar panels. If we had enough solar panels to cover Connecticut in North Africa, it could provide electricity for the whole of Europe, East and West and North Africa, is their claim. It's not going to happen in the next decade at least. But they are already starting to export small bits of energy from Morocco to um, Europe. Tourism. <coughs> That's what we think when we think of tourism in North Africa. These pointy things are called pyramids. They've been there a very long time, and people have always been travelling to Egypt for tourism. That's all you need to know. Other bits of North Africa... It's not exactly all you need to know. There's a bit more. But... Other bits of North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, they have nice beaches, so people will go there too. Europeans primarily, some North Americans. But while this is going on, you find far fewer North Africans and Europeans who are prepared to go and lie on a beach or walk around the pyramids because they say, oh, a lot of guns, funerals, civil wars, revolutions, not so sure. Why don't we look at Mexico? Well, I know, drug wars there are pretty bad too. Why not try Maine? Maine is safe, right? So there's a lot of people not going here, but they're going to Maine for their holidays. It is vacation land, isn't it, after all? Isn't it Maine? Vacation land? There you go. Um, this does not look like vacation land. You know, not for many people, anyway. Remittances. <laughs> um, you know, I always prepare my slides in Keynote for the Mac, and... And every time, there's at least one slide, isn't there, where it knocks off my uh, alignment. So this is percentage of GDP. That's what that's meant to say, not GDP, space, percent of. Remittances. Egypt, 5.2 of GDP, as far as we know. And again, if you're sending money back from New York, from your um, falafel stand to your family in Alexandria, you're not writing a letter to the tax office in Cairo at the same time to say, Dear Sir... Just to let you know, this is how much money I'm sending back to the family. Um, I, I'm not sure how people collect remittance figures. You know, I would increase these. I might just put a 1 in front of any one of them and make it 15%. Now, why do I say that? There is evidence that the figure is much higher. That's why. These figures are accepted by the World Bank. Now, with the best will in the world, the World Bank, I think, often provides much more optimistic sounding figures for certain things happening in the informal sector than it has any right to do so. So there are other economists who would take great issue with these figures, it's not just me. The un and underemployed. Are you still with me? I feel like we're going very fast tonight. I'm trying to capture those 15 minutes that we didn't have together at the start of this lecture. So. Ah. Below the poverty line, again, another interesting figure. 
how do you measure who's below the poverty line? It's not as though the states of North Africa compile very accurate figures or are providing unemployment benefits or you know, out-of-work payments to people. Again, the informal sector employs so many people, it's impossible to know. I mean, maybe a lot of these unemployed people are doing very well, thank you very much. The informal sector, I think, is one of the... It's not ignored, that's, that's not true to say. It's one of the least understood and therefore the most important part, I would argue, of any national economy in North Africa today is the informal sector. We will come on in a second to why it's so important. It's not just about the numbers. Sorry, mess up those slides again. But these figures, again, debatable, questionable. I tell you one thing, if they're wrong, it's not because they're on the conservative low end of things. But it's reckoned that in Egypt, the informal, um, the workforce percentage is 35, informal sector. That's vast. You know, how's a country going to formulate a reasonable economic plan if a third of your population have no part to play in that national economy? Now, I don't suppose many people in this room, if I said, who would like more taxes, you'd shoot your hands up and say, me, please, me, I want to pay more in tax. But I think equally, I could make a reasonable argument that taxation can be a good thing for the state of a nation. It's a question of how we spend it and what it, what it goes to. We could, we could argue about that till the cows come home, of course. When did we last see cows in D.C.? Anyway... Um, and the cows come home to roost, to mangle a metaphor. Um, Libya, 33%. And you can read the figures for yourself. None of them are small. Morocco, seemingly the lowest, with a quarter, only a quarter of the population working in the informal sector. That's huge. And as percentage of GDP? Wow. Why do we think it's lower, lowest in Libya and Algeria? Hmm? Okay, so why? Why why does oil and gas come Because it's, it's rapidly increasing GDP, but doesn't require a lot of labor. Right. Exactly. Very good. Spot on. Ugh. This one's got mangled too. I must apologize on behalf of PowerPoint. Um, who here knows the work of um, Hernando de Soto, Peruvian economist? Look him up. D E. And then SOTO, not now necessarily, but you can if you wish. Uh, De Soto, um, very interesting economist. He has his critics, and, and so he should. Everybody who has a brilliant idea should have critics. That's how we test whether that theory is accurate. I don't know that his theories apply in all circumstances, as I think he would like to claim. But one of the things he looks at is how easy or difficult it is to set up a business in a country um, he takes this as one of the markers for then um, how hard or easy it is to set up a business and how easy it is to run a business. It's very telling that in um, America, it takes, I have to explain this slide, six days to set up a business and there are six steps involved. You can imagine the word steps here, please, where my hand is. Steps. We can learn here. Um, in Tunisia, it takes 142 days more or less. This is if you get everything done in order, at the right time, signed, dotted, crossed, to the right office. This is the best possible scenario. 142 days and 54 steps to set up your business. To do it properly. If you want to be part of the formal sector, this is what you need to do. And then jolly old Egypt. 549 days. I don't have to tell any of you clever people, there are 365 days in a year. So 549 is a jolly long time. And again, if you get every piece of paper filled in in the correct order to the right office, generally in triplicate, only coming on a Wednesday afternoon, and it's 136 steps of the journey towards having a legitimate business in Egypt. Now, nobody in the room has to ask me why is the informal sector so prominent in North Africa. There's your answer. It's not worth doing it formally. This is something which must change across North Africa. It's something which hasn't yet changed after the revolutions we've seen in the past two years. And I think it's probably the major reason why all of the revolutions or coups or whatever we've witnessed in the different countries of North Africa will or can be seen to fail, in inverted commas, in the next three years. 
We will not see the progress people expect because they will not reform the economies. There are several reasons for that. One, I would say, is that they, they perhaps aren't listening to the right people, quite simply. Two, there's no political unity in the countries in North Africa at the moment, as we know. And three, without that political unity, there's no authority or legitimacy for any changes you want to impose. Those are three major problems that the economies of North Africa are facing today. This was something else that De Soto did with his organization. You remember this young man, Mohamed Bouazizi, um, whose death in Tunisia started the wave of protests across North Africa. Um, he was a fruit seller. We know that, and it's kind of a, a nice thing to think about, selling fruit. You think, okay, fruit. Another way of looking at that, he was a young entrepreneur, and that's how De Soto frames his arguments. Bouazizi was a young entrepreneur who didn't take the formal steps to get his business legitimized. So that when the police came along and took his produce on that fateful day, December 17th, 2010, and they took his scales away, which cost him $200, $200 which he'd had to borrow from people in the town to buy the scales, suddenly this guy is in debt to locals for his scales and the money he's, he's got on hock for his fruit and veg. He's not getting that money back. It's going to spoil the fruit. It's gone. Finished. Who does he turn to? Well, he's not part of the formal sector. The formal sector doesn't want to know him. De Soto discovered, uncovered, or collected the information, I suppose, that after Mohamed Bouazizi, and, and we know that there were um, very few self-immolations before um, Bouazizi took his own life, but after Bouazizi, there were 64 self-immolations across North Africa, all of which were perpetuated by entrepreneurs. 64 people who were small business owners, those were the people who killed themselves. Now, that may not tell you everything you need to know about what happened with the revolutions in North Africa, but it's a very interesting statistic to bear in mind that these were small business owners who couldn't get on. And that's why I think it's one of the very important signs that the informal sector is so important in North African, not just economics, but it is important in local politics too, national politics and international politics, because we see the knock-ons of this. We're worried about an Islamist government in Egypt. We're worried about Libya falling apart. It's all coming out of this economic corruption. The systems are broken in North Africa, and that, this is one of the results. Whew! That's a big one, wasn't it? That was a lot. Entrepreneurs sitting fired for themselves. Well, I'd be glad we don't operate in small business in North Africa. Closing thoughts, and there aren't many of these. When I say not many, there are five, precisely. Across North Africa today, these are the major problems as I see them, in, in all due humility. Um, as nobody's going to listen to me, I can say pretty much what I like. Are you all listening to me? Good. Public sectors across North Africa remain bloated. Across North Africa, from the 1970s through the 80s and 90s, the IMF and the World Bank came along and told the governments, you have to employ fewer people. Um, the Algerians did this in 1994. They listened to the IMF and they laid off <coughs> tens of thousands of workers. Riots, bloodshed, war got worse, government re-employed them all. Okay, these things take time. These things take time. And I'm not proposing that mass layoffs in the middle of the worst economic crisis that the region has seen since independence is necessarily the answer. But it has to at least be acknowledged that this is a major problem. The same is true of the problem of subsidies. You can't just take away these subsidies overnight on bread and fuel and expect people to acquiesce quietly and just eat less bread. It's not going to happen. There is going to be massive unrest, and we've seen it time and time again. And we've seen it in every one of the countries in North Africa we've studied. Whenever the government has removed massive subsidies, there is violence. Point number two. Point number three. Startlingly, and I don't use the word startlingly often. For one thing, it's not terribly easy to say effectively. But startlingly, limited economic diversity. 
Just think back to those infographics. Weren't they fun? Oil and gas dominating. A damaging lag, and it is damaging. It's damaging on a local level and a regional level and internationally as well, of course. We are all tied together in these economic problems. A damaging lack of regional and international integration. AMU, great idea. Until Morocco and Algeria sort out their political differences, it's not going anywhere. And finally, and this was the point that I'm coming back to about why I see a failure in the revolutions of North Africa in the next three years, at least a failure of what the public expect in terms of outcomes, is that there is a crippling absence of any realistic economic plan in any of the countries of North Africa. Um, how does the old song go? If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? Well, the same is true for an economic policy. If you haven't got one, then it's bound to fail. And that is the situation that the countries of North Africa face today. I'm not advocating for path A or path B or path C, for that matter. But they know where they're going. They're going nowhere very quickly. The economies are imploding. They know that's the case, and yet none of the governments of North Africa seem to be able to decide definitively what they're going to do. And that, again, is a um, related problem of political legitimacy in the region today. On which note... Oh, look, there's Algerian exports again. <laughs>